Hi, everybody. My name is Starhawk, and I'm here to share with you today something about uh, my positive vision for the future. I should say that I've done a lot of thinking about the future. I've written two books that are set in the future, The Fifth Sacred Thing. Um, that might be coming out backwards. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, City of Refuge. Um, which for me was part of an exercise in trying to imagine what the future might be like if we actually put into practice some of our ideals about how we should live and some of our principles and some of our values. And I wrote The Fifth Sacred Thing back in the 80s and early 90s, The City of Refuge, like 20 years later. Um, I was also wrestling with the question of if we created a really peaceful society, um, how could it defend itself against violence and against aggression? And for me, writing fiction is uh, a wonderful way to kind of do an expanded thought experiment. And particularly, I think it's most effective when I start with a question that I don't have the answer to. So um, that's some of the work I've done around writing and visioning. I also teach permaculture design and uh, uh, run a program called Earth Activist Training, where we're trying to put into effect, again, some of these ideals about how we can actually live on the earth and how we can design systems that can meet our human needs while actually regenerating the environment around us. So I want to share some images with you because since this is about vision, I think we should share some visions. So I put some of them together into a little bit of a slideshow about a regenerative future. And I just hope this is working and you'll be able to see it. Um, Starts off with a picture that might be a little bit surprising. That's me there with my chainsaw and one of my neighbors, Joe Cooper. Um, I never thought I'd uh, hear the sound of a chainsaw as something regenerative and positive. I certainly never thought I'd have one and certainly didn't think I'd be out there in the woods wielding one at age 70. But there I am just a couple of days ago at one of our community work days. And Joe, my neighbor is 17, uh, incredibly strong, able to use a much bigger, more powerful chainsaw and take down much bigger trees. So what are we doing? We are thinning and pruning and clearing and doing the work in the forest that needs to be done to make it more fire safe and fire resilient. Um, doing pile burns and prescribed burns and mechanical thinning and pruning. Uh, as a community, because we've been getting together as a community to do some of this work and try to make our land safer in the face of wildfire. And to me, that is very much a part of the vision, you know, that we will somehow tear down these structures of oppression and pull down the barricades that divide us and come together, whether we're young or whether we're old, and to do the work that needs to be done kind of in that spirit of those old uh, Judy Garland, Mickey Rooney movies with it's like, hey kids, you know, we can put on a show in our own backyard. Well, maybe we can save the world in our own backyards as well. Um, so to me, community is the core. Uh, it's the antidote to climate change and it's community that needs to be rooted in a set of ethics. And the permaculture has three core ethics, care for the earth, care for people, and care for the future, which is sometimes um, put out as reduce consumption, return the surplus into the system. And I believe that if we actually took those ethics uh, as our guiding principles of society, we actually could create a viable future for everybody. So let's start with care for the earth. How could we do that? How do we do that in the face of climate change? We think about climate change as massive ecosystem 
destruction on a global scale, then caring for the earth means massive ecosystem regeneration. And the good news is we actually know how to do that. Um, first of all, preserving the pristine, the old growth, uh, those irreplaceable ecosystems that just uh, have no parallel anywhere in the world. We have to preserve what's left of them. Um, doing things like we've been doing, the thinning, the pruning, the prescribed burns, returning to some of the indigenous ways of knowledge, because indigenous people manage these forests for tens of thousands of years with fire, and that kept them healthy, kept them diverse, and kept them immune to these catastrophic wildfires. Um, we need to rehydrate the earth and ways to capture water, slow it down, spread it in, sink it, restore our streams and our watersheds. And again, this is all stuff we know how to do. You know, we have the technology to do it. It's really a matter of our political will um, and our energy and our intention. Um, we can pull carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back where it belongs, in the soil. And we can do that. We don't need a fancy technology or a super giant machine to do that. We can do it in the way nature's been doing it for hundreds of millions of years, using plants and building healthy soil. Because healthy soil is full of soil organic carbon. And the carbon in the atmosphere, obviously a lot of it comes from fossil fuels. But a lot of it comes from 10,000 years of agriculture and plowing the soil and exposing it and oxidizing all of that good carbon. We can plant trees and create perennial systems and, and turn that carbon into wood and fruit and food and leaves and shade and habitat. Uh, we can develop no-till systems of growing our fruits and our vegetables and providing our food. Uh, we can create food forests that look like a forest, that function in many ways like a natural forest, but where everything in them meets a human need or provides for a need of the system. Um, we can restore our grasslands uh, with holistic management grazing. Um, it's a special way of grazing and small areas intensely and moving the animals along quickly so that it recreates the way grasslands co-evolved with grazers. Um, we can bring back the buffalo and the bison and some of the other native plants and animals and their interactions to restore uh, the ecosystems of the earth. And we can restore our human, animal, plant, ecological connections because that's so much at the very heart of everything that we do. So those are some of the ways I think we can begin to tend and care for the earth. And the future I see is one where, again, we do that. We work in community. Um, we look at our needs and understand we have a right to meet our human needs, but understand that we can look at nature, observe nature, work with nature, and meet our needs in ways that actually restore and regenerate the environment around us instead of destroying it. So how do we care for people? Um, because we can't really care for the earth unless we care for people. You know, um, the earth is not separate from the people who live on it. And if we care for the people and care for the earth, we may be able to create people who take care of the earth. You know, that might be as simple as community gardens in our urban spaces where we can grow food in the city. You know, it might be vegetables. It might be something like these aquaponic greenhouses at Growing Power in Milwaukee, where they raise fish in the tanks and run the wastewater from the fish to feed the plants. And the plants filter the water for the fish. And they've done it in inner city Milwaukee and Chicago, where they can train young people and create jobs and create living, growing green food, even in the middle of winter. Uh, we can feed people and not just feed people's bodies, but do it in a way that nurtures community, uh, that builds connection, that nurtures our soul. And that means also feeding young people, again, not just 
feeding the body, but giving them the experiences where they can explore nature and they can be in touch with nature. Um, there's so many visionary things already happening, like City Repair in Portland, Oregon, where they're creating gathering places in intersections, like this one at Sherrod Square in Southeast Portland, where they have a community tea station where anyone can get a cup of tea at any time. They've got children's play areas, an information booth, a little truck that goes around with these wings that spread out and create a little sheltered gathering place anywhere. Um, we can imagine, I imagine my writing sitting where the streets are gardens, you know, where we've torn them up to plant food and the people are moving around on bicycles and probably if I'd written uh, Fifth Sacred Thing 20 years later, they would have been on those little wheelie things and scooters and everything else. Um, but again, not thinking of a city as something separate from nature, but understanding that nature and the urban environment are aspects of each other. They interpenetrate each other. And that's beginning to happen in places here in San Francisco, like these little mini parks uh, that are taken over some of the areas that were concrete and sidewalks. Um, again, thinking of cities as places to grow our food and uh, to create things there that also meet our needs and create beauty and wonder. Imagine a city that was a green and growing environment. And the technology that was linked to art and linked to wonder and beauty. Yeah, and this vision was drawn up by Mark Lakeman. Um, we've got wind spinners up there creating energy for the city, flying like kites and balloons. And we see so many of these things like at Burning Man, visionary art, art you can interact with and climb on. You know, imagine, I like to imagine what would our world be like if we designed our society to support artists and musicians? Uh, if we thought about instead of having the idea that being an environmentalist requires sacrifice and giving stuff up, you know, it's, which is really a kind of, it's a kind of Christian formulation, you know, that somehow it's noble to give stuff up. It's very ascetic, um, comes out of a certain like warrior hero worldview that is deeply embedded in patriarchy. But imagine what it would be like if instead we lived in a world where pleasure and beauty were considered the great virtues and not self-sacrifice. And instead of saying, what do we have to give up? We're like, what do we have to envision? What do we have to imagine? How can we create art everywhere we go? How can we create a world where artists aren't supposed to be starving in garrets, but actually you know, are well-supported and well-nourished and well-resourced? Imagine what a world we might have. And this is a community project in the Mission District of San Francisco, beautiful mosaic Quetzalcoatl snake in a children's playground. That's also a, a thing that kids play on. And imagine art that then becomes ritual and that creates space for ritual and ceremony and processions. Um, you know, when we're doing urban permaculture in our courses, I sometimes tell people, well, imagine what a city might be like if uh, the deep belief about it was it was supposed to be a place conducive to falling in love. You know, what would you create? What kind of spaces would you have there? Um, what would the city look like? What would it look like in City of Refuge? I was exploring the idea of what would it look like if the city were a learning environment uh, where children were encouraged to explore and through their exploring, they might learn something about 
you know, the planets or the space stations or the history or the mathematics. You know, what if they were giant math parks where you could swing on parabolic swings or, um, you know, run around a Fibonacci spiral. Um, think of the scientists, think of the mathematicians, think of the philosophers and the thinkers that we might generate uh, if we created environments that foster all that amazing curiosity and adventure and the fun and the beauty and the ceremonies if we had public gatherings, spirals, um, city places and urban places that were designed for play and for ceremony and for ritual and for joy. And again, this is another city repair project uh, a gathering place based on the sunflower pattern, the Fibonacci series, um, the spiral, the spiral dance, and the rituals. And the wonderful thing is all of these visions, you know, it's like the seeds of them are already being planted. The real things are already happening. It's the spiral dance that we do every year in San Francisco in the Bay Area. Um, the last couple of years, because of COVID, it's been online. Um, that great joy and exuberance of belonging to a society that values you, that feeds your heart and spirit and soul, um, where you come together as a community to create energy, create power on every single level. I think that is how we create a future of hope and a future of vision. And if we do that, then caring for the future is taking care of itself. So that's a bit of my vision for the future. Uh, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. And I hope it will inspire some ideas for you. And um, I hope to join you a little bit in this uh, wonderful gathering in person, not just pre-recorded, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to share uh, in this form, in this way, this amazing technology that has helped to link us through these challenging times that we've all had. So uh, I'll just say, um, again, I, live in the San Francisco Bay Area and also up here in Western Sonoma County. Um, I teach courses in permaculture design through Earth Activist Training. And you can find us online. We are doing a lot of things online right now because of COVID. Um, we were hoping to go back to being in person, but I think we're gonna be online a lot in the time coming up. And we're about to do uh, in particular, a course, three session course on uh, permaculture for climate activists. That's going to go more deeply into some of these solutions and you're all invited to join us. So you can find information at earthactivisttraining.org. I also have some online courses in things like magic and spirituality, and you can find those at starhawk.org. And I just want to say thank you to uh, the people who've organized this and uh, the people who've created this. I feel like there's a real hunger right now for a positive vision of the future. I also want to take a moment and acknowledge the indigenous people of the land that I'm on here. It's the land of the Kishaya Pomo. And the people here have tended and cared for this land for tens of thousands of years, very, very elegantly. Uh, again, in ways that fostered some of the most incredible redwood forests and oak savannas and biodiversity and human habitat and art and culture. Um, there are people who never ceded their land to anyone else, but who uh, suffered colonizing first by the Russians and then by the Spanish and then by the Americans. Um, but they are also people that are still here and have recently reclaimed some of their gatherings, spots and lands on the coast. 
uh, and I feel really honored to be a guest on this land and to hopefully take up some of that work of tending and caring for the land uh, and bringing it back to a regenerative future. So thank you. And I will now say goodbye. <laughs>